look forward to welcoming Sam Krish, a local artist known around the world. So Sam Krish is a fine art photographer known for his dramatic landscapes, wood-based photography, art pieces, and whimsical and experimental iPhone photographs. And we will see many of those this evening. You've exhibited throughout the United States at museums, universities, art centers, and commercial galleries. Solo exhibitions include Radford University Art Museum, Virginia Tech, Moss Art Center, Allentown Art Museum, Capital One, and Academy Center of the Arts. Um, Sam has also curated photographic exhibitions at the Talman Museum of Art here, and I believe that's where we met um, a number of years ago, and has served as adjunct curator of Art of Fur Photography for us. He teaches workshops in digital photography at his studio in Roanoke and throughout the United States and teaches workshops in iPhone photography and creativity and has directed community art venues. Sam is well regarded for his iPhone work, including publication of an iPhone portfolio in Photograph Magazine and awards and exhibitions in juried shows in New York, Denver, Miami, Lynchburg, um, and Modesta, California. He has presented his iPhone techniques at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, here at the Taubman Museum of Art, Allentown Art Museum, Academy Art Center, and Radford University. He is in the process of opening a new venture, and we will see you know, some of that background behind the scenes today, Monocle Gallery here in downtown Roanoke. He received his BA cum laude in history from Harvard University, and he also has an MALS in humanities and an MA in film studies and screenwriting, both from Hollins University. And with that, I welcome Sam Krish, and I'll turn it over to you, Sam, uh, as we really dive into your background and see your work. Thanks everyone for coming. I'm, I'm very, very uh, heartened by the turnout of just, just wonderful people from all over different time zones, people I've traveled with, uh, honored members of Team Sam, and uh, really people that are on this call today are very responsible for everything you see here. Um, art is a uh, solitary pursuit. It's also solitary pursuit that depends on lots of mentors and influences, some of which are in person, some of which are in museums. And uh, I'm glad to go through a bit of that today. So uh, with that, I'll transition over into the slideshow, Cindy. So this started, photography practice started back in 2008. I was going to turn 50 years old and I, I was a writer and I would say a very blocked writer, um, trying to find a project to work on. And one day for some reason it came upon me that I should try to go someplace where I knew no one and learn a couple of things that I had no talent for and then write about them. So I've always been tongue tied in foreign languages. I thought this was finally my opportunity to get uh, true immersion learning. And uh, I've always had two left feet. So I thought maybe I would learn tango and we're better than in Buenos Aires. There were other advantages as well. It was extraordinarily cheap to live there. And I had uh, a lot of frequent flyer miles for my business days. So it made sense and it was a risk, but I took it and it led to many, many good things. So uh, what I did is through uh, guys of another mentor who I will be introducing in a second, I started a, a blog called Just Tango On. And I wrote about the foibles and the struggles and the comical aspects of trying this 50 year old midlife project. That's actually on the right, that's me when I was on my 50th birthday. As you can see, my hair has changed a little bit since then. Um, and it, it was really quite a good experience 
And of course, it started as a writing project. And uh, my good friend, Michael Macris, who's on the call, who's uh, one of my college roommates in college, uh, he, he said to me, well, you used to be a photographer. Why don't you take a point and shoot camera so at least we can see what you're doing there? I kind of shrugged my shoulders and I did that. So every time I did a post, I did a photograph. And after a while, nobody cared about my writing. and Everybody was complimenting me on my photographs. And this hurt my feelings horribly, but uh, I started to listen. Uh, anyway, I talked about uh, Bradley Foster, my creative coach, who's on the next slide. Bradley uh, lives in Ontario, Canada, and he and I have actually never met face to face, but we uh, struck up a real kinship and he helped me see how I could move forward with all of this. And I came to a real aha moment one day. I was talking with him in Buenos Aires about 18 months in, I was very depressed. I said to him, I just don't understand. I go to Spanish school three hours a day. I'm out on the streets all the time. I can't speak with anyone. And he said to me, he said, well, why is it that you, how is it that you're learning? I said, well, you know, you go to Spanish class and they hand out sheets and you fill in grammar and you do all that. He said, well, that's what the problem is. He said, you're trying to learn Spanish verbally. He said, you're a visual person. I said, visual? I said, I'm here on a writing project. How could that be? He said, yes, but you write in pictures. So thank you, Bradley. Next slide is, uh, of course, a couple of my iPhone photos of some tango dancing. And uh, this lady, uh, Susan Sandhollands, is a uh, photographer in Lynchburg and a longtime friend. When I got back, she kind of pulled me aside and said, you've got to start pursuing photography. And she really helped mentor me and got me on the right path with um, starting to take myself, not as a writer, but as a visual artist. And this is uh, the great John Paul Caponegro, uh, who, whose uh, living room I stumbled into back in 2009, just wanting to shoot Maine. I had no idea who he is. As you can see, he's actually uh, on the cover of a U2 album in this in this in this picture. But um, he um, he really got me to start to think about creating bodies of work, about a visual style, and he was just a great and still is a great mentor and friend. Well, and it was wonderful, Sam, to have uh, John Paul Caponegro and the Caponegros at the museum a number of years ago. And so that was an exciting development. So thank you. Well, I was very fortunate in order in, uh, to be able to curate that exhibition. And it turned out to be truly a great exploration of photography and creativity and two completely disparate styles from a father and a son. Paul Caponegro is one of the great masters of black and white photography. Uh, and uh, John Paul Caponegro is quite a master of digital color photography. This was uh, an image I made from that first workshop with John Paul. It was the first week I ever used a digital single lens reflex camera. And um, this may be one of the best landscapes I've ever taken, maybe the best landscape I've ever taken in. It was one of the first. This is my other great mentor and friend, Mr. Ray Cass, who was uh, encouraged by Judy Tenzer, who's on the call, to have a look at my work, uh, which he did, and he found something in it. And, you know, in a, in a really, really crazy and fortunate turn of events, including me, included me in the 2012 exhibition, group exhibition called uh, State of the Art Virginia Crossroads. And here I am uh, with four of my images 
Uh, the middle two, which you'll actually see here tonight, copies of which are in the Taubman collection. And another great influence is uh, my girlfriend, uh, Michelle Sons. As you can see, she's wearing two cameras here. So she's also a photographer and a very, very fine landscape photographer who's exhibited widely and published in uh, National Geographic calendars for a number of years. Um, she's been a great influence to my style. I had this very dark, heavy, and masculine style early in my uh, years. And as the years have gone on, my my landscapes have gotten sparer, lighter. Uh, really, the, the influence of the more feminine side has been apparent in me. Uh, this was the first major solo exhibition I had. I did have a large iPhone exhibition in Lynchburg, but this was uh, the Moss Center of the Arts at Virginia Tech. Uh, Margaret Crutchfield, uh, I guess you might say, discovered me, put together what was an amazingly wonderful uh, exploration of my work. As, as is always true when you deal with a talented uh, curator, they see things in your work that you don't. And she found lots of just wonderful, uh, you know, uh, themes and things I just hadn't considered for. And uh, it was a truly great exhibition and I thank her for that. And I think she's on the call. And we saw one of your works in, in their personal collection too on, a, on another curated crib. That's so. right, if you go back to the slide before, uh, the work that she has is uh, the one in the middle there. And uh, I feel, very, very uh, honored that she has it. And she actually featured it on her curated prints. This is what, this sort of leads me in a transition from the Virginia Tech show into a couple of my portfolios that I've had some success with. One is Sand, and this is from a, a sandstorm in, um, in uh, White Sands, New Mexico. I got pummeled by the sand, but I also got some fabulous light. And the next one, this is the passage we were talking about earlier. Margo has the one on the left, if I'm not mistaken. Margo, you can correct me later if I'm wrong, but I believe it's the one on the left. Well, Sam, and I've got a question to insert is, you know, as you're uh, you know, selecting these the, these top images that you are presenting in exhibitions and, and you know, selecting that, how many, um, you know, photographs do you take it at a certain place that you're visiting? And, you know, how many do you consider that are usually those top ones? Well, for example, major exhibitions I've been, I mean, expeditions I've been to, like, for example, Antarctica. I'll come back with about five or 6,000 images. And of those, I'll feel very fortunate if I get a um, 100 decent ones and of those 30 super ones. Um, and for an exhibition like this one, I think it had about 40 works. It, was, it probably took 15,000 exposures to it to produce that. It, it's a very large burn ratio. This particular group was shot very quickly during a break in the weather on the Drake Passage. Probably shot 200 images to get 10, but this is sort of the exception. Uh, this is also from the Virginia Tech exhibition. This one and the next one are from Deception Island, Antarctica. And this is a part of the sand portfolio. And as you'll notice, sand and sea have a lot of connection. Sand is expressed in waves and form, and so is sea. Both of them are harsh and natural elements. This one was captured at Mesquite Dunes, Death Valley. 
And this is from much farther afield. This is from Skeleton Coast in Namibia, Africa. And uh, here we have the sea and the sand merging. This is from uh, Piper Beach in Big Sur, California. Wonderful foggy afternoon, very fortunate weather, very impressive conditions. It was, it was as they say, target rich. Here's another one from that same trip, very early in the morning and uh, at California, surf and sun uh, were married perfectly. And this leads me to my ice uh, portfolio. I was very fortunate to have David Mickenberg in the Allentown Art Museum ask me to do a very large exhibition of all of my polar region works, most of which are from Antarctica, but also some from Iceland and some from Greenland. Uh, here I am with one of the ice sculptures for the opening, and I'm pleased to report that at least that show, I took top billing to Edward Weston. And we have David joining us on the phone, on the call as well. So, welcome, David. Uh, here's some uh, exhibition photos, and uh, it was large. It's about uh, fifty works, all very large prints. And I do all the printing myself. It's an important part of my process. This is a uh, palace, which was exhibited um, both here at the Taubman as well in Allentown, as well as at Capital One and welcome to Capital One on the call as well. Knight Castle, uh, I know this looks like it's at night, but it was actually a uh, day for night technique. Um, and uh, it, it helped really simplify and dramatize the conditions under which the uh, icebergs are formed into sculptural shapes. And this is tabular. Uh, it was uh, taken of a very, very large tabular iceberg um, and uh, it, it, it sort of was at the same time I was doing the passage series, there was a lot of geometry and squares in my work. I, I basically call this a Neapolitan ice cream sandwich. And this is a, a very large piece, which you'll see in the gallery later. It's called Arches 2, and it's actually six images that were shot aboard a moving ship and then put together using a digital stitch. Uh, I think it turned out very well. And then this is uh, uh, from, uh, I believe it's from the Mare Channel in, in Ar Antarctica, uh, a place of great quiet reflection and a very dramatic uh, uh, time there cold as well. That actually leads me to the usual question I get, which is, don't you freeze in these places? And actually you wear a lot of clothes and there's a lot of activity. Uh, as you will see in the top corner, I'm in the middle of a wind and snowstorm, but I'm quite happy. On the left-hand corner, I'm coming back from a Zodiac ride and I'm freezing and yes, I am miserable. Uh, and then in the middle, uh, they had some special ways for us to warm up aboard the deck. And here is uh, the Papa Negro exhibit that we talked about earlier. It's called Paul Negro and John Paul Papa Negro Generations. And Paul's work, uh, Pear is on top, and JP's work, uh, what's it called? Suffusion 15 on the bottom, one is master of uh, the zone system, wet dark room, the other is a master of digital printing, and he taught me everything I know about digital printing, and it's been a, a truly integral part of what I do. 
that's JP standing in, in the gallery with his work. Here's a couple of exhibition shots from that. Uh, it was a very large exhibition. We had plenty of space. We did uh, video interviews with both artists and we had a large uh, portion in the back where JP did illustrations of his process towards creativity. We had a number of comments on on that that you know, um, those on the call just loved that exhibition, and I know I did too. Especially how you curated that with uh, father and son. It, it was just a wonderful opportunity for all involved, and that particular gallery was fantastic. I I have been told that it's one of the best exhibits of that particular group that uh, John Paul had ever seen. And here we move to one of the other things I've done with the Taubman was in 2010, uh, John Paul Caponegro helped me understand that the iPhone was something very special, that you could not only uh, capture images on location, but you could turn them into pieces of art right there with a digital dark room with various filters, with all kinds of toy apps, and uh, it led to a really great uh, exploration by creativity. I, I took the iPhone all over the world, did street photography with it, landscape photography with it. Go back and want everybody to see that I taught uh, lots of iPhone photography classes at Talman, and they were great. Lots of people had their eyes open. Anyway, now go. Well, and they sold out every time. So that was, you know, they, and it was always over a two day time frame. So people were just really invested in, and, in, you know, learning more from you. It, it was really good. I even got a chance to do a workshop for the uh, Roanoke County um, art teachers. And that was the most exciting of all. This is um, from the East River, um, from Williamsburg, Brooklyn, looking back towards uh, Manhattan. And again, you can see there's a watercolor filter put over the image. Um, it's it's really it really was particularly at the time something unique and novel. Of course, now you can't take a street picture with a uh, phone camera because everybody has one and everybody uses it. But certainly in the first five years, it was something very novel. There's a there's one of the examples of street photography that was actually shot at the Louvre. And then I was fortunate enough to once again be included in an exhibit, this time a group exhibit at, at Virginia Tech's Moss Center. And this was called Arboreum. Uh, it was all various types of media and various types of artists from all over the world, uh, including Michelle Sons, uh, who you saw earlier. And it was all about trees. And I was fortunate enough to have some work in this uh, wonderful exhibit. These are the three images that I had in the exhibition. And uh, you'll actually see them in the gallery in a bit. And as you can see, there were all kinds of wonderful artists. This is in the foreground is a, a ceramic artist by the name of Eric Saratella, who just did absolutely wonderful um, tree sculptures that also happen to be teapots. And this was just one of the three galleries where there was work. And I wanted to close this little part of the uh, talk by going through three uh, quotes that I think really have some bearing on where I've been the last uh, years. One is, uh, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans, John Lennon. Um, it always seemed like I was making other plans rather than the ones I should be making. And there was a business career, there was uh, writing throughout. There was graduate school in um, film and in literature. I was a screenwriter. Um, I kept doing all kinds of different things and it actually took me fleeing the country to learn the direction I should be on. Um, 
So by indirection, find direction out. So I really was doing all kinds of things that were related to where I'd go, but I wasn't aware this was where I was going. And yes, when I was uh, 14, 15, 16 years old, I was a real camera bug. Then I put my camera down for 30 years and picked it up again for what you've been seeing. And third is uh, one of my college roommates that's on the call right now. His family had a motto uh, celebrating their Greek heritage, which is always late and preferably lost. Uh, always late, I think I was either always early or always late for what I should be doing in life. Um, preferably lost. Well, I hope I'm not lost. I hope I'm found. But uh, as those who have traveled with me know, and I called them Team Sam at the beginning of the call, I've had a really unusual history of leaving items all over the world, whether it be a computer case, sweater, a wallet with cash in it, credit card, you name it. And somehow all of these items came back to me. I called this Team Sam. And then what we're going to move to now is a, is a video that um, I made really over the last week. Uh, one of the things I talked about with um, the museum staff when I was putting this together is um, creativity often happens to me when I'm doing something else. Again, by indirection, find direction out. Um, so I told them, you know, if I'm out for a walk, if I'm out for a drive, if I'm shaving, often my brain switches and I put together a creative project or have a creative impulse that I hadn't really uh, expected. And uh, so this film was put together over the weekend. We had a big snow here in Roanoke and it was put together as I ran my snowblower for the first time. And uh, I think what it shows to me, and uh, actually, again, keeping going back to John Paul Caponegro, I was talking with him a week or two ago, and I said to him, what spurs you to creativity? He said, really? He said, motion. He said, I get in the truck and I drive. He said, all that visual information spurs my creativity. He said, or if I get on an airplane, that can spur it. He said, quiet contemplative moments as well. But um, working with uh, Laura Conte, we found some images in my catalog that I've never shown before and are definitely expressions of motion. And uh, so I, I thought what I'd do here is I'd show a progression of images and film that I've shot through the year, all of which have to do with motion and all of which circle back to this original notion of learning tango. And so, maestro, if you will. Thank you. 
So somehow, uh, Buenos Aires and Burma and Bhutan were all connected by motion. Uh, I never occurred to me that somehow my Asian, most of which is rather new Asian work, uh, could be placed to tango music, but it seemed to work. And it worked for me to tie everything together on my journey. Well, thanks, thanks, Sam, for sharing your journey with us, and and you know, sp that last part with that motion, you know, mesmerizing to say the least. But uh, and all the powerful you know, images, with it was really you know, speechless, and 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 that you know what you've showed us so far. I know you're going to continue with a gallery tour um, as we show you know, what's behind you and kind of behind the scenes. So about a year and a half ago, I signed a lease on some new space on Church Avenue in Roanoke and uh, started organizing a gallery in the front of my studio and I call it Monocle Gallery. Uh, I haven't been able to open it in part because of zoning and in part because of, uh, of um, the pandemic naturally. But um, here's the front room to the gallery I have works from uh, Japan and Namibia, wild and wonderful West Virginia. Also, uh, there's a uh, work from, that's, that's Japan, sorry. Also work from uh, Yakosara Beach, Wiener and uh, from Big Sur. As you can see, there's a second room that's a gallery as well. Above the door, you'll see uh, a wood print of my famous wave. And here we have uh, some of my ice and polar work, including the two that are in the Taubman collection, as well as Allentown. Another one from uh, uh, Antarctica. And here in the second room, we have uh, the images from uh, Virginia Tech from the Arboreal uh, Exhibition. And you can see the, you can't really see as well as I'd like for you to, the, uh, the res isn't great, but uh, here's some um, iPhone images that I printed large. This is from the early days. And then this is where I do uh, my work, is in the back rooms, as I have told a few others, it's never been this neat before. But I have some exhibition space in the back room. It's also where I do my printing and other production. Uh, you can see the Burmese work on the left. Uh, this is one of my ice images, large print, side of a, of a, uh, Large, um, large iceberg, or it might be a glacier, I don't remember. And then I do some more experimental playing. This is a mandala set that I've been working on with uh, eyes. And, and I'm very interested in this idea of symmetry and also taking uh, very, very minimalist uh, views of features. This is uh, some penguins uh, when you're in these areas wildlife is all around you and you don't really ignore the penguins or the polar bears or the birds. This is uh, also where I do my proofing and my, my production. You can see uh, I have a, uh, an editing station. This uh, printer is where I do my woodwork and we'll be talking about that in a few minutes. On the wall, I've got a tango picture on the left. I have Bugs Bunny in the middle and uh, Audubon on the right. Uh, on the very left is my father in my picture from a long time ago. And then, uh, so I, I do my editing at this station and then I output it to two printers. This is for the smaller work as well as for uh, the printing on wood that I do. 
And then the next uh, printer is for my large format work. And I do very large format. I do 40 by 60s. And I do all the way down to small works. Here's the beast. It, uh, it can take 44 inch paper. And here's the way uh, a print looks like when it comes out of it. And then here's uh, off, an awfully recent uh, grouping of work. About, uh, about three years ago, I started printing on wood. A friend of mine that's on the call had also done some printing on wood through a different process. This is using uh, micro-thin uh, veneers, and then uh, we mount them on wood. One of the things I love is that every image is different because the grain is different. And the pieces are art pieces. They have the feel of being something different than the usual two-dimensional uh, prints, paper prints. And not only do that more experimental work face to face, I also do more uh, traditional landscapes. And one of the joys of printing on wood is that it makes new things look old. So there's a classic look to these that really enhance the work. Um, and I'm going to, in the next uh, second or so, zoom in on one of the works from uh, uh, Namibia. It's hard with the low res of Zoom to really see the grain and the true particulars, but I think you'll probably get the idea. And this is uh, how it comes out in the printer. People tend to be very interested by this process, which is why I'm spending time on it. And then what we do is uh, we take these veneers and we mount them on wood. And you'll see a uh, gentleman that I work with for that particular part of the process, Tom Duke, who's a craftsman and handyman. And uh, he uh, he's there and he, he shows how he takes one of those veneers, as you can see, very thin, and then uh, uses an adhesive and mounts them on wood. Doing so, uh, this is what the finished product looks like. So that in seven minutes is uh, pretty much what we do here. Um, it's uh, good to have a space to make these large prints and good to have an exhibition space. I hope I can get it uh, restarted soon. And uh, I really do thank you uh, Cindy and staff for allowing me to do this uh, presentation and gallery tour. Um, it's been uh, a very important couple of weeks for me putting this together. I, I've learned a lot and uh, I appreciate both the deadline as well as the impetus. Thank you. Well, one of the questions that came in is, you know, what's next? What are you, what are you working on? What's, you know, um, you know, as you said, you know, late and preferably lost, but you know, I know you're not. So you're, you're very focused and you know, I know you've got something you're working on. Well, that's, I'm totally unfocused. Um, the last year has just been a pause for all of us. I'm trying to restart some projects and finding those images from Asia is something that Laura Conte and I did. And I'd never, I've never um, exhibited them before. So this is uh, like a premiere exhibition, uh, very exciting. And I think I'll probably probably do, be doing more with intentional motion. Uh, I'll be doing more with short videos. Um, and I'm not sure yet how all this is gonna play out. I, I did a lot of experimental construction over the last couple of years. You saw the gallery of faces. Those are all mirrored faces. 
uh, because I'm very interested in symmetry and I'm very interested in eliminating um, extraneous um, matters. That's the reason those, those, uh, those works seem to be faces that are floating in the wood, um, as well as the um, mandalas from the eyes. That, that was another project. I'm sure there'll be more of that, more that I don't do from travel, but I just do with my existing uh, catalog and putting different things together and 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 uh, trying to uh, push myself farther. I, I, I do find that I don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over again. Um, one of the things that's a little cringeworthy for me was looking back at that Buenos Aires blog. Um, I, you know, when I look at really old work, it, um, it kind of, it's not, not so much that it embarrasses me, it just astonishes me that that's where I was and that that's where I am now. And I always want to be doing the next thing rather than the last thing. Well, it's part of that movement, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, another question came in is, how do you decide how to crop an image when editing from the original? What's What does that look like? Well, a lot of times that decision is made at the location itself. So we saw a lot of images, that passage series, the tabular one that were squares. And they were done, I actually saw the square in the, in the frame, a lot of people need to see full frame in order to compose. I tend to crop in my brain on site, but it has to do with what kind of balance I'm looking for and what kind of uh, emotion. Uh, you know, square images have one type of balance, and then those large panoramics formats, is like uh, Arches 2, that giant iceberg with the long expanse of water. That's another one. And, and Wave, uh, the original landscape from the first uh, workshop in Maine, that sort of set me on my way. What is the best crop for the subject? And that Wave worked better um, in that crop than it did in anything else. A couple other questions. And one is, Sam, can you speak about the benefits of collaboration as an antidote to COVID isolation? Well, I think we're seeing it today. Um, I uh, collaborated on this presentation with uh, Cindy and Laura and Holly, and um, it, I think it made for a very, very uh, important uh, presentation for me because I learned a lot about where I've been and where I'm going. Um, and then the film that I was able to put together, it hadn't occurred to me until Sunday. So I think collaboration is very good. I think mentorship is important. I think a bit of uh, friendly competition when you're with your uh, friends out there, or when you're editing and you're swapping images back and forth is very, very, uh, you know, very important. It, it really helps take your creativity to the next level. I don't think COVID in itself is the only reason to collaborate. I think uh, collaboration should happen at all times. I mean, Ray Cass has spent a career bringing people together to collaborate. And uh, he has been extraordinarily successful with doing so. I think uh, it's always there. It, in COVID, it's harder because we're physically separated, but it's always there. Yeah, I can I couldn't agree more. And I'm, we've got one last question. Uh, you've spoken about the thematic progression in your work within the themes. Um, are you searching for metaphoric images that relay a sub subliminal thought to your viewer? Um, you know, that that would be a little bit. Um, you know, that, to me, it's a little bit condescending to think I'm going to present something to a viewer that they'll um, have in their subconscious. Uh, I hope that I can evoke an emotion. Um, it would be nice if it ended up being what I expected it to be, but it's also nice uh, if it's not. I had somebody come up to me during uh, the Virginia Tech solo show and say to me, 
You know, I just come into this gallery when nobody's here and I just cry. And I didn't know whether she meant that she cried because it was beautiful, or she cried because it was depressing, or both. But that was fine with me, that she had that kind of emotional reaction. Um, I would have rather her have maybe said that it brought her peace, but maybe she needed to cry to get peace. Who knows? I, I must say, you know, for me, and I'm sure others, and from the comments coming through, you've evoked you know, emotion as we went through. Um, we've learned you know, a lot about, about your journey and progression, and you know, we're excited to continue to see what you're working on, Sam. Uh, thank you for, for sharing this this evening, for um, you know, working with Laura, Holly, and me as we you know, went through your, your studio. Um, and thank you for your collaboration across the years. Um, you know, as, as um, we talked about and shown, not only um, curating and being part of the Talma Museum of Art and um, the Cap and Negro exhibition, um, your work um, being shown at the museum, but, you know, also at Allentown, at the Moss Center, the list goes on, Radford University and, and beyond. Um, so it's, it's great to have you here.